I have experimented with a whole bunch of ways to debalance a signal, and there is one that I think is the best of all of them that I will go over more in a future video. Right now I want to talk about how a microprocessor reads a signal, whether it's from a debalanced switch or not. All voltage-based signals are analog signals fundamentally, even if we manipulate them as digital. Pressing and releasing a switch is a square wave, essentially. Digital just means an analog signal that has been sampled and quantized, which means it has a certain sampling frequency and a certain resolution. For example, a microphone has a diaphragm that moves back and forth based on the high and low pressure from the air, which generates a voltage signal, and this voltage signal is read at a certain frequency. It is sampled, and it is turned into digital data, which can then be turned back into an analog waveform by moving a speaker diaphragm to match the samples. If you have high enough frequency and resolution, frequency is how often the samples are taken, resolution is how accurate you are, what the actual value is. High enough frequency and resolution and it will be indistinguishable to a human from a true analog signal. But like I said, even something like reading a switch being pressed or button being pressed is basically a square wave analog signal being sampled by a microcontroller that's trying to see if it's been pressed or not. When a microcontroller reads a digital pin, it will always tell the software high or low, one or zero, true or false, whatever. It'll always be one of the two. You may be familiar with the voltage range from the circuit ground to VCC. You'll read low down here, high up here, and there's an indeterminate range. Now, how indeterminate depends on the hardware. It may just be that there is a threshold in here where it'll still read high above and low below and right at that spot, it'll be unsure, like if it's using a comparator or something, if you were making your own microcontroller. But the point is, inside this range, whether it's predictable or not, inside this range, the microcontroller data sheet tells you, don't rely on these values. It'll still tell you high or low, but they may be wrong. We're not sure. Is it a high or low? It's halfway between. The sampling frequency is going to depend on the software and hardware. How fast can it read the pin? How often does it update? How often does the software run? How much is it doing in between? It may be regular, it may be sampling at a certain frequency, or it may just be reading it whenever it has a chance. Maybe like frame rate in a video game, maybe this frame takes longer than this frame, so it reads at a slightly variable rate, but fundamentally a standard rate that sometimes lags. But what you'll get, let's say you have a switch, and let's say it's being sampled and you're reading high. So the switch is going to send it low. So you're just reading, you read, 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 nobody's pressing the switch and it's just high. A steady unchanging value over and over and over. So like your square wave would be like that, so you'd read ones here and zeros here. So if you have your bouncing switch, obviously it's going to read goofy and you could get multiple activations as you sample and this is why people debounce. That's fine and all. But what if you have a signal that's more like this? Something like an RC charging curve. So you're sampling one, 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 what, 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 zero, 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 zero. So if your indeterminate range is variable, you may still get your, your varying values before you settle on zero. And you might say, how could that be? The hardware is not random, but there's noise. So if you have your nice gentle curve, in reality, it's gonna be wiggly. And let's say the cutoff is here. A little bit of noise. Let's say you have your intermediate range. Here is 5 volts and here is 4.9 volts and your signal is wiggling. It's going to read high and it's going to be safely high. You have 0.1 volts of noise, 100 millivolts. But down here, let's say this is the actual cutoff in the indeterminate range. Let's say you've got 3.7 volts here. 3.6 volts here, you've got the same noise, 0.1 volt of noise, but now it's going 101010 because it's right at that spot. So you could get multiple activations even with not a debounced or undebounced switch, just a regular signal. And the reason for that is because all of these samples in the intermediate range, it doesn't have to be bouncing to be wrong. There is no way to guarantee that a sample will not be made when a signal is transitioning from high to low. No matter how fast this changes, you could always accidentally catch it right in the middle with its pants down. But what you can do is guarantee that no more than one could possibly be made while it's in the indeterminate range. And if you only have a maximum of one spurious sample, then it doesn't matter. So if we go back to our curve here, so we have our curve, but the time zooms in. Let's say this is 
fast enough, much, much, much faster. So like on an oscilloscope, it'd be really sharp. But in reality, of course, nothing changes instantly. So it still looks like a curve if you zoom way in, but these time separations are very fast to the point that you're sampling like this. It's so spread out, you know, these could be microseconds, partial microseconds, and the signal's changing really fast. So here, you'll definitely get a one. Here, you'll definitely get a zero, definitely zero, definitely one. But here, it's in the indeterminate range, let's just say, you know, maybe closer to there. Is it going to read a one or a zero? Well, we don't know. And here, we don't know. But for each transition, there's only one spot we don't know. So let's say here's that one single sample, and then we get zeros and one single sample and we get ones. So we're saying this could randomly be a one or a zero. Well, does it matter? These are really fast. That's the idea. These samples are pretty much as fast as the microcontroller can do them, or they're as fast as you need. Maybe you only need to sample four times a second, that's fine. Or it's just as fast as you can sample, but the signal changes even faster. So the time between samples is minuscule to the point that a single delay doesn't matter. If it's a one, if we put a one here, it's just going to look like the signal is still one even though it's dropped some. Or if we put a zero here, it's going to look like we've already dropped all the way even though we quite haven't. But either way, it's going to be a single activation. We could have a one, we could have a zero, and it's just going to be off by a part of one sample's duration. The same here. If we have a zero, then it'll look like it hasn't risen yet. If we have a one, it'll look like it rose already when it really hasn't quite. So it doesn't actually matter. If we can guarantee only one sample could possibly be wrong, then it doesn't matter if it's wrong. It doesn't, you, you don't even know if it's wrong. If it's halfway, is it a one or a zero? We don't know. Literally doesn't matter because it's going to be part of the previous or part of the next, but it's not going to give spurious activations and it's still going to be accurate enough. This is the key. You have to make the signal transitions fast enough that they will always be a maximum of one indeterminate sample. And then it doesn't matter. So you can improve the integrity of a signal being read by a microcontroller, first of all by debouncing a signal, but no matter the source being read, you can slow down the sample rate of the microcontroller so that instead of having three samples in this range, you have one. That may be an option. You can use a technique to make this a sharper transition, which I'll get to in a moment, to make the transition fit within a sample rate without reducing the sample rate. And ideally, you do both. So I'm now going to show you the one single simple trick to sharpen any digital signal. A lot of the time it's going to be overkill. Feel free to use simpler ways, and I will discuss multiple ways to do this in my debouncing video coming up. But this way is foolproof, and incredibly simple, even if it takes a little extra board real estate because it uses a 555 timer chip. But this chip is the cheapest chip on the market. It's the most produced chip on the market. So it's not going to increase the cost. It's just gonna take up the space. The trick is simple. The 555 timer internally uses a voltage divider. When the voltage goes up, on the threshold pin, the timer turns off. When the voltage goes down on the trigger pin, the timer turns on, and in this range, it's not doing anything. It only responds to the transitions because it's got a flip-flop in there. And a flip-flop is very fast switching transistors. So if you have a signal like this, then going down to trigger is gonna happen about there. Going up to threshold is gonna happen about there. And what you'll get from your flip-flops is going to be something like this. And right about at this moment, you're going to have a super sharp transition and a super sharp transition. I drew it angled to emphasize that in reality, nothing is super sharp or nothing is completely sharp, but it's still super sharp. And the idea is you'll have your sampling frequency might have multiple here in the indeterminate range, but here you'll, you'll do it so that one might be, but this is gonna be faster. This flip-flop going boom, boom is gonna be much faster than your signal going and all you have to do is plug it in. The, the voltage range here with this indeterminate range, or in this case, this inactive range, mimics a microcontroller where high is gonna read high, low is gonna read low, and the indeterminate range is gonna read one of the two, but you don't know. In this case, it disables the indeterminate range and it only activates one or the other. So it sharpens the signal. All you have to do is plug it in. And the simplest way to hook up this timer, the simplest way, and all you have to do is you have your VCC and reset pins hooked to, of course, VCC, your ground pin hooked to ground, threshold and trigger 
shorted to each other. They're high impedance inputs. The, these, that's fine. This is your signal in and then out. That's all you do. You power the chip. You tie reset the, so you just ignore it. Signal into both of these and out there. You don't need a capacitor. You don't need a resistor. You don't need anything. You have the cont pin, which you usually see with a capacitor to ground. You can, but you don't need to. That's an anti-noise measure. Having a capacitor between positive and negative there is also an anti-noise measure. It's optional. Um, you have the, your discharge. That's an open collector input. So that, you don't even hook that up. You leave that floating, it's perfectly fine. It's not gonna do anything, it's an input. And that's it. Short threshold and trigger together with your input. Power the chip, power the chip, out is your output. You can ignore cont, you can ignore discharge. So you do need a chip. You need a 555 timer chip, but you don't need any extra components behind the chip. And if it's a printed circuit board, you just need traces. And that is the ultimate foolproof way to sharpen a signal. And it's going to be so sharp, I don't know that you're going to have a microcontroller that could possibly sample two times during the transition of a flip-flop between high and low. If you do, that's a really good microcontroller or a really crappy timer. But anyway, like I said, it's probably overkill. But it's easy. It's one of those things that you just remember. Anytime you need it, boom, done. That's one thing about hobbyist work that I've discovered. It's nice to have a whole bunch of things. Like, I need a buffer. Op amp, wire it up, done. It's just in my head. I can just plug it in and put it down, and I don't need to think about it and engineer a whole doggone circuit. Just plop the op amp in there and you're done. So... This is the way I sharpen any signal whatsoever. But if you're interested in a further discussion of this and more examples, watch my debounce video coming up. Until then, I'll be seeing you.